Living a life in full is a conversation you always wanted to have with that person who gave an amazing TED Talk, or the author of one of your favorite books, or that inspirational Olympian you always wanted to know more about. It's graduate-level conversations with those making a difference in the world and in the lives of others. This show brings you new ideas and approaches so that you can live a life in full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout, and I hope you enjoy this episode. This episode is sponsored by our new video course, How to Publish in the New Millennium, From Scientific Journals to Best Sellers. It's an asynchronous course offering, so you can watch it when it's convenient for your schedule. It's based on eight video lessons and provides three hours of material with new concepts, stories, and examples, and it includes several attempts at humor. You'll learn about the best ways to submit a manuscript to a peer-reviewed journal, the mechanics of book contracting, what publishers are looking for, how to evaluate and negotiate a contract, royalties, advances, copyright, and ownership, why to never first submit a manuscript to a publisher, when you need an agent and when you don't, and the differences between publishers. You'll learn about ebooks, print on demand, Amazon's Create Space and KDP programs, and other non traditional approaches to publishing, along with how to tell if a platform is of high quality or not. We do a deep dive into marketing, how to create media kits and what goes into them, along with examples, how to create a great Amazon author page, how book signings work, and how to be invited to do library talks and the economics of both along with developing speaking engagements, promotional tours, and being a podcast guest, as well as a number of other publicity aspects. We cover blogging and provide additional resources to help you in crafting your work and making it better. This is a rich, fun, and fact-filled course that covers everything you need to know from a practical and actionable perspective. It's for anyone wanting to get their written work into the world, be it academia, popular media, or both. Join the master class in getting published. To learn more, please visit tinyurl.com backslash getting published course. Thanks. Welcome to another episode of Living a Life in Full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout. April Rennie is equal parts global authority, advocate, ally, and adventurer. She spent the first half of her career focused on global development and financial inclusion, and the latter half on the new digital economy and the future of work. For more than two decades, she's seen emerging trends early, understands their potential, and helps others to do the same. Today, April is an acclaimed futurist, sought-after speaker, and trusted advisor, especially known for her role as a bridge between startups and governments, executives and customers, between for-profit and for-benefit business models, between developed and developing countries, between those excited about change and those resistant to it. She's not afraid to buck conventionality, seeing things differently, or seeking to level up her ability to help others reshape their relationship to change. April's work and travels in more than 100 countries have offered her a front row seat to witnessing change at both local and global levels. This includes the better part of four years spent solo without a permanent address, but with a backpack and an insatiable desire to better understand how the rest of the world lives. Her areas of expertise include policy reform, global expansion, the future of work, travel and tourism, sustainable development, and emerging markets. April is an acclaimed keynote speaker and contributes regularly to news and media about the new economy, future of work, and global citizenship. She's presented at a wide range of events from Davos to the EU Commission, industry convenings, and private workshops. April was the Chief Strategy Officer at Collaborative Lab, a firm specializing in international microfinance, impact investing, and regulatory reform, Global Director of Water Credit at Water.org, and Adjunct Faculty at the International Development Law Organization, Director of the World Wide Web Foundation, an advisor to numerous social enterprises and financial institutions. As a lawyer, she helped draft new legislation and created new investment vehicles for groundbreaking business models in several emerging markets, which are considered global best practice standards today. She's been an advisor to startups, companies, financial institutions, nonprofits, and think tanks worldwide, including Airbnb, Nike, Intuit, and the World Bank, as well as governments ranging from Singapore to South Africa, Canada to Colombia, Italy to India. 
Her new book, Flux, Eight Superpowers for Thriving in Constant Change, will be the main focus of our conversation today. April holds a JD from Harvard Law School, an MA in International Business and Finance from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, and a BA in International Studies and Italian, summa cum laude, from Emory. She's a Fulbright scholar and studied at studied I'll stutter through this studied at Oxford University, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, the European University Institute. She's a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and is ranked one of the 50 leading female futurists in the world by Forbes. She's hiked everywhere from the Himalayas to Aconcagua, runs an impressive half marathon pace, is a certified yoga instructor and an amazing handstander. Welcome to the show, April. Thank you so much, Chris. That was quite the intro. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, this is awesome. I just, I have to give a, to start off with a tip of the hat to our mutual friend, uh, Michelle, who we were talking about uh, before we hit record for connecting us. And it's, uh, we were saying that, uh, you know, it seems like we've been kind of circling each other's uh, spheres and universes and stuff. So it's nice to be able to very much enjoyed reading your book and kind of getting some insights into you that way, but then also having this opportunity to have a very nice conversation and get to know you even better publicly this way. Thank you so much. And likewise, I love all the small world layers and connections yeah. and it really brings us to today. Well, you transparently and, and I would even say poetically start your book with an experience that you had while you were at Oxford that seems to have perhaps in my interpretation of it influenced not only the trajectory for your work uh, and, and but your new book and but also really um, your desire to rebuild family, to live a life of meaning and to be a, really a lifelong advocate for mental health and humanity. Do you feel comfortable to share and unpack that maybe to start with and then we can shift more into your work and then finally with the book? Oh, absolutely. I'd be delighted to. So yeah, I mean, connecting it to the book at the outset, I often like to say that my my baptism or my entry into a world in flux, a, a world of constant change, but in which everything changed. And I'll give the caveat, like way back when, I didn't think I'd write a book about it. I didn't know how the future was going to unfold. But I look back and that was the moment that I began to really be interested in humans' relationships to change. So go back with me um, more than 25 years ago when I was in college and I was at Oxford and um, I received the news on, it was the very last week of my studies. I was about to head um, to the European continent to lead a, a study trip for the summer. Um, and I received a phone call from halfway around the world, halfway around the world. Um, and it was my older sister, my only uh, sibling. And she informed me that both of our parents had died in a car accident mm. um, and that I needed to come home. Wow. And it was that moment in which you just don't believe what you're hearing. And, you know, whatever I thought my reality was, whatever I thought my future was, whatever I thought the world, however I thought the world worked, it all just kind of melted mm. before my very eyes, just before my very being. Gosh. And, you know, I had to figure out how to move forward. Um, and that was, you know, how, how do you rebuild your family? What does family even mean? Um, what about my career? How does this affect what I will do? Because in this weird way, going through a tragedy like that makes you realize very clearly that I could die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if I were to die tomorrow, what does the world need me to do today? Not what does my ego need me to do? Like, what does the mm -hmm. world need Mm -hmm. um and and what candidly what do you do when you don't know what to do and so it sort of catapulted me it, it did make me grow up really fast but it also in this way I wouldn't have been able to, to describe it quite like this back then but it gave me walking through a fire like that gives you a kind of clarity <laughs> um not that you have it all figured out and know exactly what to do but you realize that there's so little in the world at the end of the day that you do control. And when you can get better at letting go what you can't control and sort of preparing yourself as best for as best you can for whatever the future may have in store, that that will serve you very well over time. And so, um, yeah, that was in many ways like planting the seed for what later became not just a book, but my own way of seeing the world and humans place in it and how to help others reach their full potential, even though no one knows what tomorrow holds. Wow. 
that just you you talk too about the book of um, almost kind of like being somewhat adopted by one of your professors, and, and mm. that that kind of gave you then the the transitional sense of of a family or some kind of of grounding. Can you share that with us? Absolutely. And I would say more broadly, so my Italian professor and her family to this day are, um, you know, they didn't officially adopt me because Mm -hmm. I was still under, I was still technically a minor when my parents died. So like the joke was always like, I couldn't, I couldn't sign paperwork. I couldn't even have a drink (laughs) technically, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I was yet somehow expected to do all of this other stuff that was much deeper and, you know, required, I think, digging further into one's soul. Um, But what, what that experience taught me from a family perspective is that family is what you make it. And there is blood family. But there's also what I call and what I have called ever since then a family of choice. And it can be as big or small as you are willing and interested and able to invest in. Um, It is people who love you and care for you just as family would. Um, It requires that you be open to see them. Because I think with my Italian professor who knew me before my parents died, but never met my parents the way in which she and her family stepped up. And again, it was it was me fumbling mm-hmm. in the aftermath mm-hmm. of truly not knowing what to do. Sure. And then seeing the kindness and the goodness of others who simply want to be there for you. And then you start realizing, gosh, we, we kind of enjoy one another's company. <laughs> and gosh, this feels really good. And, you know, another tangent, I think, in all of this, but it, it may be relevant in some way. I grew up in a household that was um, complicated, we could say, Mm -hmm. in which my dad was my best friend. He was my rock. Mm -hmm. He was my champion. We were like two peas in a pod. We Uh really, we got each other. Uh And my mom was difficult to put it lightly. Mm -hmm. Um, She was clinically depressed. We now know she was bipolar, but Mm -hmm. back then you weren't diagnosing or talking about these things. Um, It it was an incredibly difficult time with my mom. So losing them both at once was like losing the person who, who cared about and knew me best. And also a person who had, who had really um, made me feel like I wasn't worth very much, um, Mm -hmm. who had been struggling with her own inner battles. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I say this because my parents, I think all parents (laughs) in their own way, my parents did the best they could with what they had. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a very good guidebook for (laughs) right? So back to this family of choice, all of a sudden, what this family has taught me over the years, oh my goodness, there's a difference between conditional and unconditional love. (laughs) There's a difference between seeing somebody simply for who they are, whether or not they share your last name or not. Like there are all these different ways we think about family and losing my parents allowed me, yes, it forced me to crack open and open up, but it allowed me to expand my view of family, but also the kind of family that I was allowed to grow and nurture in the years since is actually quite extraordinary. It's something that I actually wouldn't want to give up. Um, and that's not any kind of disrespect of my parents. It's mm-hmm. just this sense of, wow, I had no idea of the many different kinds of ways that we can mm-hmm. live and love and be there for one another and show up. Wow. You know, I feel that, you know, how, how you've just described this comes through so many times, I think, in your book. Um, and it, it it's sort of like the, the meta aspect of this is that you seem to have such a fine-tuned set of antennae for observing these kinds of things and recognizing these kinds of things. I don't think that that's necessarily as obvious to, you know, John and JQ public in their circumstances. And you have such a... Um, I don't know, an adaptive response to things to take on challenges and, you know, to not get caught up in, you know, all the very, you know, um, deserved, you know, uh, 
this is awful and, and I'm in despair. And, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, grief and all that too with it as well. But it just seems like looking over the course of, of your life, as much as I know it from doing research and preparation, that uh, throughout that you've had that as, as you know, we'll, we'll talk about superpowers, but I mean, that also seems to be kind of a, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, you bring to your work, but it seems very much um, authentic to who you are as a person. Um, I think this might tee us up nicely to uh, segue into your book. Would that be good? Sure. And I just, I just want to say real quick, like, thank you for that. Um, I think what's interesting, I have, I have been in the depths of, of grief and of this sense of like, this is not, and you could say fair, mm -hmm. this is not good. This is not <laughs> right. You know, I've yeah. been there and yet, and maybe you know, this is more existential, perhaps we can re refer to it, um, come circle back to it a little bit later, but it does factor into flux as well. I have this sense that while we're here on earth, like when, when someone comes into the world, we're, we do have a right, um, we have a right to dignity, we have a right to humanity, we have a right to love, we have a right to to work, to use our efforts. Like we have certain fundamental human rights, right? Mm -hmm. But in separate conversation about how many people think they're now entitled to certain things. And it's like, no, this <laughs> is, it is a privilege to be here, right? Um, but at this more existential level, I think what I realized was that like, yes, I have a right to be happy. I have a right to pursue my dreams. I have a right to do these different things. But if you strip back another layer, I don't actually, I, you, no person on the planet has the quote unquote right to even exist. Hmm. And I know I'm going really deep, like kind of that's woo woo. Good. No, that's but the good. Notion that we're all on borrowed time. The fact that we exist at all is a, it's a miracle. It's, it's magic. Um, and so as such, seeing the human experience as even the really hard stuff, is still part of this magic. Mm -hmm. Even going to the depths of stuff you don't want to deal with and shouldn't happen to anybody, it's still part of the magic. And so for me, it was this sense of there can be goodness even in the hard stuff. And the longer I've lived, the more I've learned the really good stuff is actually in the really hard stuff. <laughs> um, if everything came easy and everything were just handed to you on a silver platter and you didn't have to deal with the hard stuff, that's actually not a life in full, actually. Yeah. That's not a life fully lived. Um, and so I just want to tee that up because I don't know, certainly it's been years and years and years of practice, 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 and thinking hard and connecting dots and quite a bit of therapy in the middle of all of that as well. Um, I don't think it's something I just came into the world thinking or seeing differently. I've had to really work at it. But what I love is it is, it's actually accessible to everyone if you're willing to pay attention and do the work. That's good. Well, that gives hope for people that maybe have that as a struggle, that it isn't necessarily yeah. programmed in one's DNA, but it's a it's an adaptive kind of thing that people with, with yeah. work and effort can do. That's good. Yeah. Good. And Thank that there's not, there's <clears throat> magic. It's it's just unbelievable that we're here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's a very good point. Right, right. As part of this magic. Yeah. And appreciating it, <clears throat> pardon me, I think appreciating it as such as well, too, and kind of, I don't know necessarily it's a reframe of it, but just maybe a, a perspective of looking at it through that kind of lens, I think kind of does reframe it in a certain level for people that might always be kind of a, you know, um, maybe look at things in a more negative, you know, but behind every silver lining is a great cloud. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and I find that people who have this sense of I'm entitled to be happy, <laughs> They're the ones who end up being unhappy. <laughs> right. Well, and oftentimes bring a lot of others along for the ride yeah, as well, too. Yeah. So, as opposed yeah. to the, like, take it all together. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And the the difficult times help you appreciate the happiness. Yeah. And then when you are happy, I I find that you appreciate it 10, 100 fold more kind right, of thing. Right. Um, but anyway, I, I oh, didn't mean good. to. Uh, no, I like that. No, this is, that's what this show is for. That's good. Well, in the segue to your book, I have to first read a few of um, some of the notables that have said uh, just wonderful and I think spot on kinds of things about it. Um, Adam Grant, New York Times bestselling author, said, 
Many people see change as a threat, but April has spent her career learning to recognize it as an opportunity. Flux is a reassuring, hands-on guide to treating unexpected events as challenges to embrace rather than obstacles to avoid. Daniel Pink noted, if you fear change, read this book. Flux will help you discover the power and the beauty in the invisible, the imperfect, and the unknown. Chip Connolly, New York Times bestselling author and founder of the Modern Elder Academy, said of your book, Flux is both wisdom and a wake-up call for all ages. April's style is that of a dear friend who celebrates you for who you are and encourages you to evolve. She brings her whole self to Flux, sharing personal stories of loss and transformation alongside first-hand accounts of how change is viewed around the world. You'll never look at change and uncertainty in the same way again. And our mutual pal, Michelle Wilker, said, who's also a best-selling author of uh, Grey Rhino and You Are What You Risk, uh, who was on the show very recently, said that uh, April will help you replace the old static script of your life with a flux mindset, a new way of thinking and being in a world that will help you to write and revise many drafts of your own future. Developing your flux superpowers will help you navigate an uncertain world, tap into your sense of purpose, and make the best risk decisions. And also, with a little applause, we traded some emails on this, but uh, your book is in the Next Big Ideas Club, uh, is honored in, in that as one of the top ones, and also named one of the best new books of 2021 by Men's Journal, which all of this and, and the comments to are very well-deserved high praise. So tell us, how, how did you come to this book? Oh, thank you again. And it's it's kind of funny. I'm so deep into the book that I don't get to take a step back and and hear some of these ovations and whatnot yeah, you need like, to, so thank you uh, i'm like what we, so we well. can we can pause for a second you can take a victory lap and then uh... <laughs> <laughs> no it's just it's been such a long journey um and a joyful journey but as i know you know i mean one of the one of the hardest things I've ever done to create this book and to bring it safely into the world. And, you know, hard just in terms of that, that effort and that discipline. And it's just, it's hard, yeah. um, but I'm thrilled in how it's all come together. And so that's, that is a good segue into like, how did, how did it happen? <laughs> and I do like to say that um, I have been writing the book, um, actively writing it since 2018. So uh -huh. sort of three years in the active creation phase, mm -hmm. but more like the better part of three decades in the actual making. When I go back to that kind of entry, that baptism into flux that I described earlier of losing mm -hmm. my parents, that's when the journey began. That's when I began collecting dots, ideas, perspectives, examples. Things started informing my view and my relationship to change. Again, didn't expect I would write a book on it um, for the vast, the, the, the majority of the 25 plus years since then. But then it was roughly six, seven years ago. Um, and it wasn't like one thing happened. But prior to that, for 20 plus years, people had been asking me, when are you going to write a book? And many of them thought I would write a travel book because of my adventures around the world and I so forth. And they were like, we'd love to read April's adventures. Sure, right. right. And I was always like, you know, I, I like to write and, and I had a little travel blog and whatnot. But it goes back to this question that I started asking myself um, in the aftermath of my parents' death, which was, if I were to die tomorrow, what would the world need me to do today? How could I best serve others? So it was always about, and my parents had made it very clear um, to me when it came to my career, they never pressured me into, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that. They were both educators. Mm -hmm. So very clear focus on learning, education, and and travel and diversity, that diversity <clears throat> was our strength kind of thing. That was the environment in which I grew up. But they always made it very clear that my career could never be about me. Hmm. It had to huh. be about serving others. Nice. And they would say, you know, there are lots of ways you can serve. You can be a teacher, you can be a doctor, you can be an environmentalist, you can be all these different things, but never think that this is about you because, um, and this goes back to some of the, I think their upbringing, they always reminded me, and I have these memories of, you know, being little, little before I was even in elementary school, where they would tell me the fact that I was a girl 
and got to go to school just made me so lucky. Wow. One of the luckiest kids on the planet. Wow. And of course, <laughs> I thought that was the Kool-Aid that all kids were asked to drink, right? <laughs> Do I learn like, no, that's actually a really special thing to be told every day. And then to be encouraged to pursue that learning and those discoveries and so forth. And so back to the book and these, the 20 plus years in which people are like, you should write a book. And I would be like, okay, a travel book. And then I would ask myself, okay, if I were to die tomorrow, what does the world need me to do? And I could never answer that question. The world needs me to write a travel book, right? I was like, no, <laughs> it, it, like, with all due respect, the world needs me to be in the field. The world needs to, me to be rolling up my shirt sleeves and getting to work on, again, financial inclusion, digital inclusion, whatever the, you know, lots of different issues, but the world needs help. Mm -hmm. I need to be out there doing. And then about six, seven-ish years ago, there was this shift and it was almost, it was not imperceptible, it was very perceptible to me, but sort of overnight, I woke up the next morning. And again, not one thing had happened, but I do remember I was in this time in which lots of ideas were swirling in my head and you're feeling kind of overwhelmed by like all that's happening around you most of it good some of it challenging mm -hmm. but I woke up <clears throat> in the morning and all of a sudden I was like oh my gosh I have a book coming out of me <laughs> like <laughs> and I didn't know it was flux at that time I knew it was about change in some way but all of a sudden it became this oh my goodness I don't think I'm going to be able to proceed if I don't write this book. I, I think this happened. It was like this wow. force, like force. And what I love is that also previously, I think when people say, you should write a book, we'd love to read your book. I was always like, I'm not going to write a book to, to tick something off a checklist. I'm mm -hmm. not going to, I'm certainly not going to do it because somebody else thinks I need to. Right. That just doesn't, oh, torture. that does not That'd resonate with me, right? Yeah. And the shift was, I need to get this, I need to A, figure out what this book is, and B, I need to get it in the world, and it's not because other people think I need to do it, it's because I actually think, I could finally say, I have lived long enough and layered enough, again, examples, ideas, perspectives, cultures, you name it, around change, I'm connecting dots in ways that I don't see others doing yet, I have something to offer of value to humanity and the best vehicle to do so is a book. Okay, get to work. I could finally answer that question, is this the best use of my time? I was like, yes. So then though that began the process of, okay, what's the structure? What's the title? You know, all of that, which takes many more years as you know. Right. But that's kind of how, that's when the, how the seed began to, it had been planted long ago and then it was just dormant. And then how I began to water it and then how it began to sprout and grow and from there. I love that. You note in the book why you <clears throat> called it flux. Can you share why it's so fitting? Such a great word. Oh, I, yeah, I love the word flux. <laughs> and and that we did not land on that on day one. I you know, bet. It, it, then <laughs> lots of post-its on the walls and lots of surveys, <laughs> lots of ideas hashed out and all of this. But um, flux is both a noun and a verb. So as a noun, which is how most people know it, and I love that many people are like flux. It, it's kind of a fun word to say, but I can't say I've ever really dug into it, right? <laughs> but, but the noun means continuous change, continuous movement, motion, like things are in flux. The mm -hmm. world is in flux. But flux is also a verb. And to flux means to learn to become fluid. And I love that because there is this element of our relationship to change and the world and the future in flux that we all need to learn how to flux. So um, yeah, that's what it means. Also just a fun shout out that uh, the other place that flux, I've learned this in the course of writing, the other place that uh, today flux often shows up is in metalwork and soldering and jewelry making. Right, yeah. Flux, <clears throat> flux is the agent. It's the chemical agent um, or chemical compound that binds the metal to the jewel. So when you're making jewelry, your, the flux is the thing that makes it beautiful. Uh, when you're making stained glass, the flux is what holds that colorful, beautiful piece of glass in in the metal casing. That's right. So, yeah. <clears throat> I used to do stained glass a million years ago as a kid. And, mm -hmm. and you had your little 
jar of flux that you, you know, wiped onto your copper and your glass and your soldering and stuff. So it, yeah, it seems so befitting in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, I want to talk about superpowers, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about um, scripts. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. I want you to talk about scripts and, and shifting mindsets. I, I loved how you said in the book that um, uh, like we treat constant change and uncertainty as a feature, uh, that we should do that, not a bug. <laughs> I just I thought that was great. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. So the book, people have been, people often say to me like, oh, you wrote a book about change <clears throat> or my favorite change management. Oh, I'm gosh. like, no, <laughs> no, I did not. With all due respect to change and change management, I wrote a book about humans' relationships to change and how complicated and messy they are, but also how ill-fitting, how unprepared we are. And I say this at the risk of generalizing, but the vast majority of humans on the planet today we are not really well equipped to think about and relate in a healthy way to a world and a future influx, a world in which we cannot control. And the only, you know, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. <laughs> and so this notion of what, what do our relationships to change look like? And very few of us, in my experience, including myself for much of my life, we didn't, we don't really talk about this kind of thing. We, we, manage change, we react to change, we do something about it, we take action. But we fail to recognize that whatever we're doing in the outside world is still coming from an inner relationship to change. And so one of the things for as complicated and messy as our relationships are, one thing that's become clear to me is that our relationship, how we think about and talk about and behave around and react to change begins young. And it's part of what I call our scripts. So your, our scripts are the narratives and norms and stories by which we live our lives. So you have a script and I have a script and everyone has a script. Everyone's script is somewhat different because we all have different lived experiences, but all of our scripts are clear and our scripts define the world we expect to live in. And again, a lot of this is taught, absorbed. It's something that it's part of your socialization, right? Were you told to approach change from a place of hope or fear, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of your script. You pick that up from somebody, your parents, your teachers, your community. Were you taught <clears throat> that uncertainty is dangerous or is it an adventure for your curiosity, <laughs> right? Two different scripts here, but they have profound effects on how you think about and relate to change as an adult. Um, were you taught that you know, things should generally go to plan. And if you're, if whatever you plan to do doesn't work out that somehow you failed, or were you taught that, you know, most things don't go to plan. And so you learn to be adaptable and resilient and so forth. These are two different scripts, but also in your script are things like study hard, get good grades, um, go to college, get a good job, climb the ladder, retire, right? A linear career path. That's right. part of a script. Sure. So there's lots and lots of different parts of your script. Um, the challenge we face is that for many people, many cultures in many different ways, and again, this isn't judging or criticizing. This is like everybody in some way, <laughs> everyone's script in some way, shape or form is not really fit or aligned with the world that we live in today. And here's where, you know, I love the fact that I didn't write the book about 2020 or a COVID, the COVID pandemic, <laughs> but um, just look at the past 20 months right. and how much of that worked into your script, like <laughs> not very much. Right. And so I have this wonderful example to point to what I'm trying to explain and uh, help people with on a much longer term kind of universal basis um, with the best example I could ever hope for right in front of me. So that's a bit about our script. So this notion that a lot of what we've been told and taught about how the world works and our expectations and assumptions of how we fit into it, a lot of that gets really challenged. It gets sort of tossed upside down when change hits. Mm -hmm. And so this forces us to reassess what is and is not fit for a world in flux. And that leads us because I fundamentally believe that even though there's more change ahead and certain uncertainty and all of this, you know, the future is not more stable or more certain. The future is more unstable. The future is more unknowns. The future is more flux. 
I don't think we're very well prepared for that. <laughs> um, but in that, in that fact is just this enormous opportunity for all of us to learn, to level up and to improve how we relate to change. And so you've getting a sense of what is my script and what parts are outdated and ill-fitting. That's, you know, part of this process to developing what I call a flux mindset. And a flux mindset is that state of mind, that ability to see all change. So whether you expected it or not, whether you would deem it good or bad, whether it is the coolest thing to ever happen or like the worst thing you could possibly imagine happening, to see all of that as an opportunity to learn and to grow and to improve. That's great. So, <clears throat> pardon me. How does the flux mindset um, integrate with the theory of flux and in, in those three steps? Are they, is it a separate kind of thing or is it part and parcel of it or kind of unpack that yeah. for us? So I have this theory of flux, which I always have to remind people, like I'm not <clears throat> an academic. It's not a heavy handed, you know, lots of empirical research. I am taking a lay person's view who has lived long enough and worked with enough different kinds of people and organizations and cultures and situations to have a perspective on change. And so the first step of this, um, of opening a flux mindset of the theory of flux is recognizing that your relationship to change can improve. Now, not, it's not the same thing for every person, you know, the ways in which you need to improve varies from person to person, but we can all use some help. Then you're going to open this flux mindset, which again, it's not a matter. It's not like ticking a box. It's just acknowledging that actually I have a lot to learn about my relationship to change and I can actually level up. I can improve, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next step is taking this flux mindset and using it, applying it, harnessing it to develop your flux superpowers. And so there are eight superpowers, each is a chapter in the book. And the superpowers really reflect the practices and the disciplines, or if you will, the quote, how to improve your relationship to change. And so that's kind of how your script, a flux mindset, and the flux superpowers, very big picture, work together. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that <clears throat> that is a very good segue then into let's let's start to deconstruct some of these eight flux superpowers. I, I think in the book you said something is like a a bento box for the mind or something. I just I love your your turn of phrase. It's that's what I meant about like it's poetic. I just I love that. So um, yeah. the first one is run slower. Tell us tell us what that means. Sure. Well, let me let me first just do a quick. Um, I don't need to overview all eight, obviously, but um, just a little bit more on like, what are these things? Because I love you mentioned a bento box and I do like to describe the superpowers. Uh, they are a menu, not a syllabus. <laughs> so what I mean by that <laughs> is good. you do not have to do one before two. Uh -huh. You can do, you can practice just one or all eight. Um, one thing I love about the book is all of the superpowers stand on their own. They're all equally legit and valid and can you can sort of dive into them on their own they do enhance one another though so the more you practice one or five or whatever the easier it becomes to see and understand where the other superpowers are, are heading um but technically i do advise that people read the introduction to the book first but then i like to say you could read the book backwards like <laughs> you you don't have to read these in order because they all have their own freestanding value and i like to remind people just like go where your curiosity takes you because in my experience and it's really fun now that the book is out and i can you know people can get their hands on it and really absorb it that pretty much everybody there are a couple of superpowers that they tend to immediately love or gravitate towards or be intrigued by they're like oh yeah tell me more <laughs> and there are you know at least one sometimes more superpowers that make people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I love asking people, and even in this conversation today, as we talk about some of these, pay attention, what superpowers or what aspects of them make you uncomfortable. And it may be that all of them are counterintuitive in some way, 
some of them run against the grain of what society tells us. Some of this might go against what's in your script, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not judging anything. I'm not none of that. I'm simply saying there are many, many, many more ways to look at how we relate to change. How might you improve? And so I, I like to tee up the superpowers as a whole by that, by saying some of what I, some of what we talk about today, I'm pretty sure some listeners are going to be like, mm -mm, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> Great. Pay attention to when that happens. That is a signal of where your relationship to change might need a little bit of extra attention. It's also just a great opportunity to learn more. That's good. So, I, I, I have two favorites and I want to, yes. I want to ask you if you have one and I want to get, if you do, I want to guess what one it is. Cause I have a, I have a guess. <laughs> so do you, okay, well, what are yours? Tell me. My I'm two curious. favorites are uh, know you're enough <clears throat> and create, of course, we've talked about this uh, off mic before, but uh, create your portfolio career. So um, those, the, and uh, you know, it's, it's like, um, do you know that story about, um, uh, Joseph Heller, the Catch-22 author, and, and Kurt Vonnegut. Is that, do you know that story? Does that ring a bell? I think I might, but I'm not. The, as, as, as urban myths may go, <clears throat> the two of them are at some posh cocktail party at some rich fella's house. And Kurt Vonnegut leans over to Joseph Heller and says something like, you know, well, you know, you've got this popular book and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, this is, you know, look at this guy's place and oh my gosh, and great food and, you know, posh, posh surroundings and furnitures and art and stuff. And, and Joseph says to Kurt, uh, well, I have something that he doesn't have. And Kurt looks at him quizzically and he goes, I have enough. <laughs> and I just, I love that. And, and I've just, I've been doing some research on some stoic stuff for another project and, and like the whole, you go into that, you know, very, very, very well. So I'm not going to, but, but, um, uh, can you, do you want to unpack that for a second or, or. What's yeah, your... I love that you bring up the know you're enough and we can circle back to it, but, okay. um, I did, I do know that I've heard that story and I, I love it. Isn't that wonderful? Um, oh my gosh. Well, and here the, the punchline, if you will, of the superpower, know you're enough. And that's why O you are, um, know you're enough. Mm -hmm. And people, that's a typo. And I'm like, no, knowing you're enough, why O you are, your point of sufficiency, satisfaction, harmony, balance includes knowing that you are enough just as you are without doing anything further. Yeah. And that is a huge challenge that we face today in which, and it's fed by consumerism, yeah. it's fed by social media, but this whole notion that you will never have or do or be or earn or whatever enough. Mm -hmm. And it's this, again, it's a narrative. It's part of your script. If you absorb it, it's a narrative, it's a norm, it's a story that we tell ourselves about ourselves, which is completely untrue. So the superpower itself though, really it digs into our obsession with more but also our quest for true happiness. And the punchline is that when we seek ever more, so more, 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 and that's not just more money or more power, that's more love, more likes, more followers, more clicks, right. more clothes, yeah. more everything, right? Yeah. Take your pick. Mm -hmm. When we seek more, when we're always after more, we will never, and here I will use the absolute never, <laughs> find enough. It can't happen by design. It can't happen because think about it when you're always after more, what happens when you get more, you need more. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's this, pit. it's this cycle that keeps us mostly miserable. Yep. Um, and I'm seeing this a lot, particularly amongst younger people. Mm -hmm. I am deeply saddened by the fact that when I speak with um, students and this is high school, this is certainly by the time they're in college, this sense that they've already they've drunk that kool-aid they've already at that age they firmly believe that they will never actually have or do or earn or be enough wow and that is deeply disturbing to me because that is a human constructive narrative that we are doing to ourselves and yet you know so part of what i want to do with this chapter is catalyze a different kind of conversation around you and I, everyone on the planet is enough just as they are when they are born. Now, that doesn't mean we can't set goals and strive to achieve and do things. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying our inner worth. And 
how this plays out is people start going after those ex external metrics. I will be happy when I will be right. successful. when. Yeah. each of those things implies that you're not that now and that you <laughs> need something more to get there mm -hmm. versus back to the Vonnegut story. When you actually recognize that you're enough, just as you are right here and right now, it reframes completely. What do you need to be happy? Why, why can't you just be happy right now? Right. Now, yeah. like yeah. this is it. Yeah, um, and well, that plays out. It kind of circles back to your appreciation to the gratitude aspect of things. You know, to be able to to say, you know, here, like your your very fundamental example early on about being a, a small, you know, little girl and being you're so lucky to be able to have education. You know, and just having having the appreciation for things that oftentimes people take for granted or inadvertently squander, and you know, don't don't miss it till it's gone. You know, kind of thing. Make a good country and western song or something. So totally, but, totally. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, but I do know that your your question was run slower. Let's go back to that for a okay. minute. Okay. Yep. Let's. So, mm -hmm. um, I love the I love taking tangents, and I also feel really bad when 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 we never actually get back. Oh, to we'll life. circle back. I got notes, so <laughs> nothing's gonna slip through the cracks. No worries. <laughs> so um, so run slower, which is the first uh, superpower. And again, that doesn't mean it's the most important. Right. It just I I will say it's one that everyone wants to talk about. So that's good. Uh huh. Um, Run slower. This is all about anxiety and burnout, but also making wiser decisions. So the superpower itself says that in an ever faster paced world, your key to success and well-being is to slow your own pace. So let me explain. Um, consider this. And we didn't talk so much about this at the outset, but you know, there's lots of change in the world today and so much is changing, change, change, change. It's not though just what is changing. It's also the pace of change, right? And the way I like to put it is that the pace of change has never been as fast as it is today. Hmm. And yet it is likely to never again be this slow. Hmm. <laughs> and when you let that sink in, it's kind of exciting and it's kind of terrifying, right? Um, now, Think about what our scripts typically tell us. They say that when the pace of change quickens, you're supposed to run faster and just keep up, right? <laughs> this is where I kind of respectfully raise my hand and say, I think we've got this wrong. So think about, like really everyone who's listening, think about this. Today, we already know that the pace of change is increasing. And many of us are already running as fast as we can. Yet, society is telling us that no matter how fast we're running today, we should run even faster tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and all of this effectively for the rest of our lives. And I look at this and I'm like, time out, hold on. Not only what kind of life is that, but this isn't a reality in which anyone can truly thrive. <laughs> So from where I stand, this focus on running ever faster leads at best to burnout and exhaustion, but worse, it leads to none of us, lead, none of us reaching our full potential. Mm. And, you know, I always have to call out too, like, I did not, when I say run slower, I did not say stop. I did not say <laughs> be lazy. I did uh -huh. not say do nothing. I said run, but do so at a sustainable pace. Because mm -hmm. when we run fast, 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 we actually miss much of life. And the way I always like to put it is like at an extreme, when we're running ever faster, ever faster, ever faster, we risk running straight past life itself. <laughs> and when we do that, we actually completely miss what really matters. That's good. I remember um, Stuart Brand from uh, Long Now Foundation mm -hmm. said something like, uh, "Bad things happen fast, and good things happen slow." <laughs> you know, it's sort of like mm -hmm. I, I just get, that's that came to mind. I, I forget if that was in your book or if it just came to mind when I was reading that. But it's and you give you know one of the other things I should give a shout out and to as well with the um, the structuring of the book. You know, you talk about ways to you know actualize these things. It's you know there's a certain you know theoretical perspective 
answer to it, but then you bring it into the real world. You talk about micro sabbaticals and not to do lists and nature bathing and tech shabbats and things like that. I, I and it's, I, I find that so helpful because it's sort of like you know I'm starting like I read something it's like yeah I get that, but you know what you know how would I apply it and then I you know I keep reading further and it's like oh okay okay yeah mm-hmm. I could do that I can experiment with that and it's it really does make it a very actionable. You know, going from a, a, a thought perspective to a behavioral perspective is, is super helpful. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and that's I've tried to make the book very reader friendly, very um, action oriented, and also to let people make it their own, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. sense of here's a menu of things you can try. Um, not all of them will appeal to you, but hopefully some of them do. And, um, and I find that works really well. And then, you know, at the end of each chapter, there are a series of questions and prompts and like, just trying to like, turn it into a, uh, a, a a guidebook of sorts, but like, it's not about having one destination. Right. So, um, thank you for that. I will say, and this is more just a footnote, the book is for individuals, um, and how you can reshape your relationship change. And also, of course, I do a lot of work with organizations and I always like to remind them, they ask me, can an organization have a flex mindset? I'm like, of course Mm -hmm. it can, Mm -hmm. insofar as an organization is a collection of individuals and this can become part of your organizational culture and so forth. Um, There's still a broader societal reckoning we have here in which every single person on the planet today can begin to run slower. One of the things (laughs) I love about actually all the superpowers None of them require technology that we may or may not have. None of them require any money. Um, they're all kind of easily- That's a great point, yeah. You're drawing on a lot of your inner wisdom, but you're paying attention. So I love that. Um, I will say, and when I work with individuals and um, leaders and, and executive teams and so on and so forth, there is also this broader reckoning, which is as a society, If we're going to, individuals desperately want to run slower, desperately need that sense of calm, of reduced anxiety and so forth. And yet societally, there's still this kind of manicness. And so I'm trying to figure out um, how do, and it's not for just for me to do, there's this sense of more broadly, we need to be having conversations like this across society and also rethinking what is the messaging that we're putting out? Because insofar as individuals are crystal clear on their desire to not flirt with burnout, to make better decisions, to show up more fully themselves, that's terrific. That's what we should all want Mm -hmm. for ourselves and for others. Yet if society is still doing this like hamster wheel, run, 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 then we've got this big disconnect. Mm-hmm. And that societal reckoning, I think, is something we still need to be paying attention to. It's a good point. It, it makes me think of the whole kind of blue zone concept and, you know, mm-hmm. the people with longevity and the kind of lifestyle that they have. I mean, it certainly seems to be that, you know, shift away of, of running slow and appreciation of nature and, you know, finding the joy in cooking a meal or, you know, serving tea or something like that. So... So to circle yeah. back, I I I want um, I want to know if you have a favorite one, but don't say it yet. Do you, do you have a favorite one? Um, that's I like to say that's like asking your favorite, your favorite child. <laughs> okay, well, okay, all well, right, I get it, I get say, it. <laughs> what I can say is actually I often have a favorite. Okay, that, I would I would have I get it. That's that makes perfect sense. That, that's touche. That's and, well but put. I can say so it changes often sometimes uh-huh. <laughs> a few times in the same day um, <laughs> i will say though is that there is one of the superpowers that i call the sort of super superpower oh. because it powers and it fuels more than any other one okay and that is actually the fourth one which is start with trust okay and i say this because when it comes to how we navigate change at some point pretty much everything comes back yeah. to trust that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally get that because it, it, you know, it, it, it determines behaviors and in, in, in full embarrassing self-disclosure. That's probably my hardest one. 
um, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, I can lay down on the couch, Dr. Freud, and, and you know, spin mm-hmm. you some stories. But the, um, you know, it is so fundamental because your action, I think a person's actions are very much predicated upon, you know, you know, do I trust this person or do I trust this company or do I trust this contract or do I trust, you know, do I, what am I getting myself into? And if you, you know, if you're always protecting yourself because that trust is lacking or you're going, you know, full throttle into it because your trust is, you know, fully there and ensconced, you know, that, those are very different behaviors, very different actions. So, all right. I would have guessed, um, it may the, that it was, um, uh, getting lost because <laughs> I know you and your travel bug and your your backpacking era and all that. So uh, so that's that, that would have been my guess. If that any is a listeners favorite, are wondering, that definitely shows up as on the favorite list. Mm-hmm. Um, so does portfolio career. Yeah. Um, yeah. So does let go of the future, which is so hard for people. So <laughs> let go of the future. That's all about our humans' relationship to control and our comfort or discomfort with ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's funny too, because when we say what's your favorite, favorite can be the one that I feel like I've most recently made success, progress on, right? Okay, sure, sure. These are not one and done quick fixes. This is not something you pick the box and move on. Like you're constantly chewing on them. And just when you think you've improved on one, you have for some time, then something else changes. And so you're like, oh, another chance to improve, Mm -hmm. right? So sometimes (laughs) favorite is the one that I've just made the most progress on. Um, more often though, for me, my favorite is the one that I actually need the most help with. Hmm. So it's interesting, even the word favorite in what way? Cause a lot of people would say, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. That's not my, you know, <laughs> my favorite thing, not the thing that needs the most work. Mm-hmm. Um, the favorite one is the one that I can tick off and be like, don't want to done with that. Yeah, right. Yep, yep. When I find that in this case, that, that takes me further from my journey of personal growth. And so I'm constantly digging in. The favorite tends to be the one that um, I need to practice the most. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, and get lost, I will admit right now, not just in, well, it's not just about travel and that kind of getting lost, but that is a key theme in the chapter. I, I will admit that um, given the last 20 months and the lack of travel <laughs> and the, the wanderlust that is going crazy, that right now I I feel like I am... Um, I am so primed to practice that. <laughs> yeah, blow the blow the dust <laughs> off the backpacks. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, it is sort of surprising too with the uh, let go of the future as, uh, being written and spoken by a renowned futurist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so yeah. I get I get the paradox. You know, that's that. I think that's that's kind of inspiring as well too. You know, to to not be um, pigeonholed or shoehorned or, you know, uh, otherwise classified by certain kinds of labels or whatever, which goes back to then the portfolio career. What do you do? Well, you know, I do a lot of stuff or, you know, so it's, I see kind of the, the, the ability of these to be standalone individualized kinds of, of concepts, but then you certainly see sort of like this Venn, this moving, you know, acid trip Venn diagram of these circles, you know, overlapping at different levels at different points, like you say, you know, points in the day, but you know, it's, it, it, the, the, they, they're in flux, April. <laughs> yeah, well, well, and the way I like to put it and, and the let go of the future, just a quick footnote on that. Uh-huh. Um, yes, it's quite fun when people are like, you're a future. You can't say <laughs> yeah. that. Whoa, right? whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Hang on, hold up. Um, but then I, again, I'm like, let me explain what I mean, because the superpowers, yes, they're counterintuitive but they're actually far more fit for a world and a future in flux. And when I say let go of the future, I do not mean giving up. I do not mean failure. I do not mean doomsdaying. I actually mean quite the opposite. And what the superpower says is we need to learn how to let go of the future. Or I could also say, let go of our need, our obsession with predicting and controlling the future, like singular. Mm -hmm in order to let better futures emerge. This is all about getting out of our own way and actually recognizing that we're so focused on, I need the, like there's one, as if there's one future. (laughs) I need the future to go this way and it needs to go my way. And if it doesn't happen like this, all hell's gonna break loose. I'm gonna fall off the rails, whatever. Mm -hmm. That is so not the way the world works. 
not just in terms of neither you nor I nor anyone can predict or control the future. Um, we can only control how we respond, which I think a lot of people have heard, mm -hmm. but also this notion, neither you nor I nor anyone can single-handedly predict or control the outcome, but we can control whether and how we contribute to an outcome we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. When it, so this notion that there's one future, no, if futurism 101 teaches you <laughs> that there are all kinds of futures that could play out. One of the challenges we face as, again, individuals and society is that we have this very narrow vision of what could happen. And we don't entertain a lot of other futures that could happen. Um, there's not a guarantee. None of no one future scenario tends to play out exactly as you've scripted it. Yeah. But in the world of futurism, there is this process called scenario planning, scenario mapping, which is a hugely helpful tool to map out the many different possible future scenarios that could happen. And then you basically imagine, okay, how would we prepare for each of these things, right? And it's hypothetical, but what ends up often happening is that different threads, different aspects from different scenarios do end up coming to bear. Not exactly as you'd imagine them, but some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. And the process of preparing for many different possible futures, but letting go of the future, as if you know what it is, that's where we actually could um, help ourselves a lot. And also stop getting so twisted up on ourselves. <laughs> stop getting, finding ourselves in these just really difficult, often mental situations um, because we somehow think that we can predict, but then if we get it wrong, that we've somehow failed. Right. So there's this notion when you learn to let go of the future, what you find is it's actually really empowering. It's really <laughs> freeing. Um, people who learn to do this actually feel a sense of peace. Wow. It reminds me, I, was it Kevin Kelly? Somebody said, I think I want to give the attribution to Kevin Kelly, but I'm not sure. Um, but that the future is here. It's just not equally distribu distributed. Not, yeah, <laughs> it's know. not Kevin Kelly. I can it, find it. Is it Watts Wacker? I can't remember. Stuart, no, I want to say it's Stuart, and I should know this. I Stuart need Brand? Say. No, not Stuart Brand, whom I adore as well. Um, oh, the name is on the tip of my tongue. Um, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> We're just saying we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so this this is good. I, I I really I like how your book, in some sense, sets a context. You know, for appreciation, understanding, clarity. It also, like we've said, you know, with like some of the the tools and suggestions and things, could could be tools that we could actually you know test out on ourselves, test out with ourselves, and, and try them on for size. I'd like to maybe finish up our conversation. I would love to talk with you all day, but I would love to start to get towards the end and talk about maybe things at more at the macro level. Is is that good? Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. So, so with these kinds of things, someone has, has picked up your book. Um, what are some of your recommendations of like, how do we get started? What's your advice for folks who are maybe overwhelmed with the change that they're now facing, or, or maybe they're burned out with work and COVID and life or whatever? What's a, what's a good starting point? Mm. Well, it's interesting because the very first thing that I suggest people to do is to spend some time getting to know your relationships change. Hmm. That a lot of people, we've not thought about it this way. Sure. We're so busy. What am I going to do? How am I going to react? How am I going to manage? It's, it's all about, again, the external reactions to change without recognizing that every, and this is where I sort of get into this riff in the book about mindset versus strategy, mm -hmm. you know, that every single, we focus so much on the strategies, what decisions we're gonna make, what investments we're gonna make, like what are we gonna do? Hmm. We don't recognize that every single strategy and investment and decision you make is fundamentally rooted in your mindset. And just, this isn't a navel gazing exercise. I mean, it's very much <laughs> designed to get to action. Getting to know your relationship to change, like what excites it, what triggers it, what delights it, what makes it go off the rails, uh, what kinds of change. And I often have people do this exercise where, you know, just even reflect on the past 20 months um, on a sheet of paper, draw two columns, you know, one with a plus, one with a minus. <laughs> in the plus column, write down all of the changes in the last 20 months that you have loved, like big or small, at work or at home, like doesn't matter, don't 
overthink or judge them. Just write down all of the changes you've loved. And then on the other column, write down all of the changes that you've hated or really struggled with, right? And then look at those lists and, and start considering like, what do the changes you've loved have in common? What do the changes you've hated have in common? And then you start seeing patterns, right? right? And yeah. for example, one of the patterns that ends up coming up quite often is the changes you've loved, my hunch is that they have some sense of hope, anticipation, freedom, choice, agency, growth, like some sense that something good was going to happen from this change. Mm -hmm. The changes you've hated tend to be driven by fear, by anxiety, by anger. Um, the role of privilege is actually super interesting here too. I find that privilege often blinds us. Privilege keeps us from wanting to change. Privilege makes us more fearful of change often hmm. because it threatens that privilege kind of thing, right? But we're blind to it yeah, in many ways. Sure, and there are many sure. privilege as well too. Yeah. Um, so all of this is just like, what is your, what I call like, what is your flux baseline? What is your starting point? Mm -hmm. That's where you've got to kind of get to, because then it becomes typically quite, I don't want to say easy, but quite clear, which of the superpowers you might want to head towards first. That's good. Yeah. You, in your work life, one of the things that you've spent a lot of time thinking and, and consulting with is around looking at the, the future of work. So are there areas where people's scripts and anxieties, um, like, I, I think that can manifest in, in their careers, you know, people are worried about their job or their next job, or they're not happy and they're burned out like we've talked about. But do you have any career advice for someone who's worried about the where the future of work is taking us? Mm, yes. And this feeds directly into the sixth superpower, one of your favorites. So um, <laughs> creating, creating your portfolio career and seeing your career less as a linear singular path to pursue or a ladder to climb and much more like a portfolio to curate as an artist or an investor would. And one of the things that I love about this um, superpower and, you know, I've, I have had a portfolio career for the better part of the last 30 years. Um, it's not a brand new concept, but it is very much getting traction and resonance in today's world. And again, this is where I love, like I've been writing about it for years, but now we've got this thing called the great resignation mm -hmm. and the great resignation fits really well with this shift from career path to career portfolio. It also speaks to how do you create a career path and a professional development um, journey that is more unique to you more customized to you, but also helps you become unautomatable, so to speak. And hmm. so the way that I, I like to phrase it is that the, the future of work is full of uncertainty. I will not sugarcoat that. It is jam packed. One of the <laughs> areas with the most unknown and uncertainty out there. So it can be hard to know what to do or hard to trust that things will work out. One of the beautiful things, one of the many beautiful things, things I, I really appreciate about this concept of a career portfolio, two things. One is everyone, that means you, if you're listening, you already have a portfolio. You may just not realize it yet. Your portfolio includes all of the skills and roles and ways that you're able to create value and contribute to society. And it goes way beyond your resume, but everybody, including high school students, elderly people, people in transition, people who've been out of the workforce for a while. Everyone has a portfolio, but creating it and curating it requires getting deliberate about what are you doing with your professional, a lot of this is about your professional identity, what's in your portfolio. So that's one. And second though, is that no one can take your portfolio from you. You own it, it is your responsibility, but it is also your legacy. It is, it is your professional identity. Because one of the things that I find makes a lot of people nervous today and at the risk of being really blunt, it's true. Insofar as someone else gave you a job, even if you love your job, even if you're really good at your job, insofar as someone else gave you that job, that job can be taken away. Hmm. 
And that's where so much I think of the fear and anxiety sets in around this. And, you know, sure, it could be eliminated by automation. It could be eliminated by an organizational change. It could disappear for all kinds of reasons, having nothing to do with you or your abilities or even your team and colleagues. They may be really well-intentioned too, and you could still be without a job. Your portfolio, and so when you find yourself on this career path in which you're supposed to kind of climb the ladder and pursue that straight line, you get thrown off that and a lot of people end up in a kind of identity crisis versus a portfolio which is seen as deliberately evolving with you and that what you're doing is mixing and matching and recombining the skills and and capabilities within it. You create your portfolio you curate it, you own it forever. No one can ever take that from you. And so that in today's world of uncertainty and flux, again, it's really empowering. It's really reassuring. It doesn't guarantee that, you know, your career forever is all sorted out. There's nothing you need to do, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. But it does give you a sense of agency and control of something in a world which feels very much, I think, out of control for a lot of people today. That is beautiful. Yeah. And and here, here to that, I I feel like having those kinds of things, I think people, you said early on about like this linear, you know, progress, you go to school, you get a job, you work your job, decades pass, you retire, you know, et cetera. And it's a very stepwise function, linear progression kind of thing versus looking at it in the context of a variety of different kinds of experiences might inform other kinds of, you know, your next job that maybe has nothing to do with what your next job is, you know, and I think having those, to me, that adds such richness, but also a diversity. I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. I remember, gosh, there was some Harvard Business Review article some years ago, and they talked about like the team of people that they were bringing in, and they were all these diverse kinds of, of people from education, background, ethnicity, culture, perspective, and it just made for all the richer of whatever their work was that they were doing. And to look at yourself that way and look at your own career that way, you know, I, I think is very, I don't know, there's a certain, it brings me a certain peace, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's sort of like exciting to, to think about that or to say, oh, you know, to, to also not squelch yourself to say, you know, there's so many people I think that, um, you know, start off, you know, with their freshman major as X and by the time they graduate, it's B, you know, <laughs> and, that's, and that's a good thing, you know, to, to be able to do that. Or then they go to graduate school for something totally different. So that's good. Exactly. Well, exactly. I, I have, I will. Yeah, let me just please please there's not only that more diverse teams tend to come up with more solutions they tend to have they have more experience to draw from mm-hmm. for me i continue to come back to this and what does this mean about how we navigate change hmm. and the more diverse your team the better you're going to navigate change because you're drawing on a much deeper well of skills perspectives experiences and when we're in a world in which, let's be honest, no one knows what to do. <laughs> no one has figured it out, right? And anyone who tells you they have, that to me, the more confident they are in saying, we have figured it all out, the more I'm like, no, you haven't. No, yeah, you haven't. You're just, right. just really insecure right. <laughs> about it, right? right? And so that's where, when nobody knows, the more different ideas and um, abilities and life experiences that we can put together the better for your solution set, but also your overall resilience. And so I love that because even if it's you're early in your career and you're like, I don't know if this is what I'm going to do forever. Doesn't matter. It's going to be useful to your your portfolio later on. And I know you and I talked about this and I actually had a conversation with somebody just yesterday about it. I loved it (laughs) where they spent um, their twenties. They really wanted to be an actress and it, ended up not working out. I mean, couldn't make it in New York. Wasn't, uh-huh. wasn't going to be the thing, but continued to act on the side and so forth and love stage production and all this kind of stuff. And they ended up um, in a leadership role, but it turns out that they're now up. There's now this new um, entity that's forming and I don't want to give too much up, but basically they're going to stand out from every other candidate because of their acting experience, which is what this job needs, but it's not in an an acting kind of world. And so it, the thing, the thing that they wanted that they 
really wanted to do and gave it their all, but then they thought that they would be kind of shunned by society when they were like, well, I was an actor, but it didn't work out, you know, right. either from a failure perspective or a kind of like, oh, you've been wasting your time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, ends up being absolutely the secret sauce. <laughs> That's secret great. Going to help them get this job because no one else, if you look at the requirements for this role, uh -huh. very hard to meet every single one of those bullets. Like basically, we they're asking people to speak many different languages figuratively right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very hard to find somebody who speaks 10 languages fluently but in this case that one language ended up being that thing on their resume that they they love doing but didn't get to do for that long and yet lo and behold um again it just it becomes their um their secret ingredient That's yeah great. so i think we all have each of us has our version of that kind of story something we love to do but we think society won't take it seriously or we don't really have as much time as we'd like to invest in or whatever the case may be it's something that you wouldn't necessarily put on your resume but it is 1000 percent part of your portfolio and what makes you stand out that's good it also feels like um this kind of aspect is is very much um in a nassim talib anti-fragile kind of way of it, the total antithesis of automation you know, if you think about someone being afraid about automation being a replacement for them, that the, the, just what we have just talked about, you know, for the last five minutes is is the the total opposite of that as well, too. So there's a certain resilience or even anti-fragile aspect, I think, of that in terms of what a portfolio career can mean for people. And hopefully that's a, a salve to diminish anxiety about, you know, what it is and maybe an accelerant to saying, well, maybe I should try something different, even if it's not specifically within what my last job was. So that's good. It is this sense of how do you make yourself as unautomatable as possible? Yeah. <laughs> and if you are only good at one thing and that one thing becomes capable for automation AI to do, mm -hmm. you don't have a lot to fall back on. That's right. That's right. You can do a common. So partly it's, can you do many different things and then you lower, you mitigate your risk, but it's the combination of things. And um, what I love, it actually was Jerry Garcia who said this. And it does show up in the book. But the quote is, don't be the best, be the only. <laughs> and I love this because he was like, listen, okay, I'm in a band. There will always be somebody who's better on the guitar than me. There will always be a better singer. It's not about being the best. Be as good as you can be. But more than being the best, be the only person that can do A and B and C. And oh, by the way, can do them together, right? <laughs> That's when you look at this and you go, there's just no machine that can replicate that. That's right. That's good. You know, Scott Adams, the, the Dilbert author, said something similar to that, that you may not be the best physicist in the world. You may not, you know, whatever, except, you know, yeah. pick whatever. But that same kind of Jerry Garcia point of, but if you have this and you have this, you know, you don't have to be the best. You can be, you know, very good at these three things and then you are the only. <laughs> so I like yeah. that. I really like that. And also every single one of us has our only. Mm -hmm. Good, you may not excellent have point. It, but every single person has it. Try to just, and, you know, I, I like to encourage people again, kind of in starting out, what does it mean to have a portfolio career and where would I start? Where would I go? Where, do, how do I get started? Mm -hmm. um, start writing down what is in your portfolio right now because your portfolio is itself unique yeah. now that doesn't guarantee that all of a sudden you're the only and you have to do the work of developing your portfolio narrative around it you have to do the work of connecting those those dots and showing how that played out in the real world um but everyone has their only that's good well, I know we you've got some uh, other activities going, but I, I have one last question if you're still good for time. Sure. I, I just have to ask, and this is going to sound probably a little corny, but uh, can you share with our audience some of the ways that you live your life in full? Oh, goodness. Um, oh, that's a lovely question. Oh, good. Um, yeah. So huh, a couple different ways I would take that. One is to echo a something I said earlier, this question, this, this defining grounding question for me, which is, if I were to die tomorrow, what does the world need me to do today? Hmm. If I can answer that and I can look back at any given day and say, that was what I needed to do. And sometimes the world needs me to write a book. And sometimes <laughs> the world needs me 
to just be there for others and focus all of my attention on other people and serving them. And sometimes the world needs me to actually take the day off and go for a hike. <laughs> and that might sound really selfish, but you know, that is absolutely what the world needs me to do to show up fully for others tomorrow kind of thing. So if I'm living my life in full, it is this sense of, did I spend my time, any given time frame, day, week, whatever, did I spend my time in a way that was of greatest service to humanity? You know, that's a certain kind of fullness that I would mm -hmm. feel. Um, so that's one way. And then another way, and I kind of blush when I say this because it's not, I think you don't go after doing this, but then when enough people start saying this, giving you the same feedback that you're like, oh, wow, that's really nice. <laughs> um, people keep saying that I just, I, I show up really authentically. They're like, it's just, it's just you. <laughs> and that's everything from you write your book just like you talk <laughs> to like, like I, I, true. I'm in conversation with you. Um, you don't mince words. You, you don't, you don't sugarcoat answers, but also like you go there, even that sense of like, is it okay to talk about your parents? I'm like, Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> now, have I also spent time? There've been times in the past. Had you asked me that question, I would have said, yes, let's talk about that question. And I would have cried. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean I don't want to talk about it. That just means I want to, I, I want to show up fully, which makes some people uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I do think also leads into this life in full. That's so good. for me, living a life in full also means it's the sense of living true to my values, but living true to who I am. And another fun piece of wisdom that I, I picked up from a teacher a while back that he picked up from another teacher. Um, but I love the way they put it, which is you can spend your life trying to be somebody else. But at the end of the day, you're never going to be good at being someone else as that person. <laughs> and no one, no one on the planet will ever be as good of a you as you. So the message was, you know, be the best you. And that to me speaks to authenticity and genuineness and, and just showing up fully. And that means the warts and the scabs and the <laughs> scars and all that. Wow. Those are your stories. Those are your stories. Those are what make you you. And so living a life in full means showing up not with, um, not with shame, not with um, a sense of having... N not with regret, mm -hmm. not with um, any of that stuff. It's like every single one of my experiences has made me who I am. And so this is my life in full. That's beautiful. Well put, well put, no surprise. So April, this has just been a treat for me. It's been so enjoyable. Um, what are some of the best ways for our listeners to get a hold of your book, to learn more about you, to connect or follow? Thank you so much. So the best way to get a hold of the book, um, it is available on Amazon. You can, you can Google it and Flux comes up. But um, all things Flux, including more resources, um, more articles. I've tried to make a lot of information just publicly available, even without the book. Um, that is fluxmindset.com. And then um, I also have a personal site, aprilrinney.com, which is where you find the handstands. So I, I give that <laughs> yeah. there. Um, and thus far, I have not found anyone else with my name. Um, my last name is Finnish, and I think it's just April Rinney is rare enough that uh, I am April Rinney on all social media handles. So uh, Twitter and find me on LinkedIn. Um, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. Good. Well, I will put all that in the show notes as well, too. So again, my heartfelt thanks uh, for being on the show. It's just been a, a treat for me and I'm looking forward to what comes next with you. Thank you so much, Chris. And likewise, this has been an absolute joy and a gift. Um, and on the one hand, overdue, and yet on the other hand, like exactly when it needed to happen. So thank <laughs> good, good karma. Living a Life in Full is a production of Stout Media, a subsidiary of Gordian Knot, LLC. Assistant producer, Gracie Wong. Music, Dan O'Brien. Executive producer and host, Dr. Chris Stout. 
To learn more, stop by our website at Life in Full for show notes. And please recommend us to your friends and subscribe on your favorite platform. And as for the obligatory disclaimer, this podcast is for general information uses only. It does not constitute the practice of psychology, medicine, nutrition, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical or psychological advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I take conflicts of interest seriously. For all of my disclosures as well as show notes, please see livingalifeinfull.org slash podcast and my LinkedIn profile. Thanks, and until next time.